What is happening? No, it is not Alex. It is House Lasku here. The sixth man is away on, I don't know what he's away doing. He's um, he's taking a break. He's taking a well deserved break. This is the first video without Alex in it. And it's uh, House Lasku leading the fort. And we have got one of my fellow Ospreys from the 904 B Money. We've got Brandon from the Pod About Nothing. Uh, one of my mates from uh, North Florida. Brandon, give us a quick little introduction about yourself. Yes, sir. Hello. Hello. Uh, you said he's away. Is he away on a holiday, as you call it? Potentially. Nah, he- are you trying to violate? Are you trying? Are you trying to start this already? Okay. Um. I. I he, he's, he's taking. Yeah. He's he's, a, he's on load uh, management. He's on load yeah. management. He's had a lot of back to back games. Hello. Yeah. He's a <laughs> load management. Um. But yes. Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Brandon. As uh, as Eddie said, there we met uh, back in the day at UNF in college here in Jacksonville, where I was born and raised. Uh, recently moved down to a little bit further south, down to Orlando, Florida. Uh, been here for the last couple of years, but. Uh, big sports guy, uh, as, as Eddie referenced here before. I have a, a podcast with two of my best friends as well, uh, called The Pot About Nothing, uh, where we talk about a lot of different stuff. Some sports kind of worked in there, but uh, would love to talk some more sports specifically, and even more specifically the NBA and, and my favorite team, Miami Heat. So very, very, uh, you know, thankful to be here. You recently just had a controversial bracket up uh, where you did best Drake songs. How many songs was it again? Thirty-two you chose from. Thirty-two, thirty-two we chose from. Yep. And I was listening to yeah. some, I was listening to Drake's essential uh, playlist on Spotify, and there was about fifty songs that you could have put in that bracket. Um, what was the biggest snub actually Easily. that you put from the bracket? Oh man, uh, "Take Care" was one that that was oh. tough to not put in there. I think a couple people picked uh, in the comments. We we posted we did a post and asked for people to pick what they thought would win the whole thing. And there were at least two or three people I think that picked "Take Care" to win the entire bracket, and then we didn't even have it in the bracket. So that was one uh passion fruit people seem to like a lot i know that's newer I, I, i'm not a big fan of it but that was it's a popular one uh and we didn't include any uh features songs where he even had people featured for the most part um like nothing off of what a time to be alive no yeah. no jump man no oh, any yeah, of that yeah, kind sure. of stuff so left left a lot of that kind of stuff out too um yeah so i, I sense it's, potentially it's a future bracket of some future drake bracket so anyone who's definitely into their uh, their music definitely make should check out a pod about nothing there's some great content on there and of course they've got some funny characters like chris sure. and david and just some other guy who's there um so let's uh, as you mentioned you're a <laughs> miami heat fan um tell us a little bit about what um what led you to become a miami heat fan instead of you know your local team which is orlando you little snake Right, right. Well, again, uh, as I said before, I grew up in Jacksonville, so Orlando would have been the closest geographically speaking. Started really watching a lot more of the NBA in probably around 04, 05 ish. Uh, so I don't even know, God, however many years that ago or that was ago at this point, but um, a year or two into Dwayne Wade's career early on uh, and really got hooked as a Miami fan the year of 06, the, the year that Wade carried us to. A, uh, an NBA Finals, an absolutely legendary Finals performance, um, averaged 35 points a game, something like that. Uh, really just dragged us all the way through that that playoffs and into those into those Finals for the championship. So, um, became a fan off watching him. He was one of my favorite players at the time. And fun fact, my favorite player before him was Chauncey Billups, not oh, not nice. one that's, you know usually nationally regarded as a super exciting player or one that a lot of people would have as their favorite. But uh, he, he was my favorite. I was a big Chauncey Billups guy. Nice. I, I really don't know why. Um, but yeah, eventually became a, a Heat fan and a, and a D Wade fan, and that just kind of carried on from from then all the way till now. I have been locked in as a Heat fan. I don't, you know, didn't I wanted to stick with Wade where he went, but I wasn't necessarily pulling for Chicago or Cleveland in those little six month periods and years that he was there. I just it was it was weird to me. So I stuck with Miami uh, all the way up through now. So nice, and will continue to do so. Yep. I mean, a D Wade was great, but we all know he didn't have as good as a career as Paul Pierce. So. Um... Uh, I know your feelings on Paul Pierce and I mirror those feelings as well. Some quick yeah, questions on Miami. Okay. I think I know the answer to this already, but you could maybe sway me gotcha. a little bit. Um, who is Miami's GOAT? So obviously there's an obvious answer, but there could be someone else in contention, maybe? It's it's Dwayne Wade, but if I had to name somebody else that was outside of him, I would actually be Pat Riley. I think he's what he's uh, orchestrated and what he's okay. built up through the Miami Heat organization over the time that he's been there from a coach now a head of well, I don't even really know exactly what his position is anymore um, he's had such an influence over the heat and in the drafting of Dwayne Wade and the building of that franchise that um, I don't think there's a Dwayne Wade coming to Miami and that team being put together the way it is without a Pat Riley so 
he isn't my goat. He's probably the second, you know, the one B to Dwayne Wade, but he's a very important figure in the Miami, you know, heat lore. He, he uh, Pat Riley is, his position is head of the table. And that, I think that's just to sit to the T. Uh, yeah. And I mean, on Dwayne Wade, change the whole county's name. It's, it's not Dade County anymore. It's definitely Wade County. Wade County. Um, that is. On the flip side, give me someone who you feel is a little bit overrated in Miami Heat history. Actually, let's do one current, one pre- one present, one uh, one vet, or one. Okay. Previous. Are we going just just in Heat history, or are we going overall? Just in Heat um, history. Okay, just in Heat history, one person that's that's overrated, um, and it is sad because it's one of the greatest players of all time. But specifically within their time at the Miami Heat, their their contribution, I feel like, is. Um, propped up to a certain level that it shouldn't be. And it sort of dismisses how impressive it really was what D Wade did in the 06 finals. Uh, and that was Shaq. He was there and he played well and he played well early on and played well in the regular season. Uh, but he wasn't the same as Laker Shaq. If I had to guess, I think Shaq averaged somewhere in the ballpark of like 14 and eight, you know, 13 and 10 or something like that. in those finals, like I said, he played well throughout the year, uh, played well in the playoffs, but People look back at those finals and they're like, oh, yeah, the D Wade and Shaq. I mean, D Wade played great, but thank mm-hmm. God, you know, they got Shaq there. I'm like, if there's a lot of guys that could go 14 and 10, maybe not in the finals and maybe not in the way and with the force that Shaq did. So he was important. But uh, in terms of being overrated, yeah, I, I hate when I hear, like, oh, yeah, thank God Shaq got there. And then also they brought LeBron and Bosch in there so that Wade could win. I'm like, mm, Wade damn near carried that team by himself in 06. So you need to put some, some more respect on my guy's name. So unfortunately for Shaq, uh, yeah, it's got to go Shaq for, for most overrated in terms of yeah. heat heat history. Um, in that playoffs, in the whole playoffs, I'm not sure of the finals. In the playoffs, he averaged 18.5 points, uh, 9.8 rebounds, and shot 37% from the free throw line, which is about what you expect, I guess. So on the flip side, who do you feel someone who in Miami Heat law is a bit underrated for their contributions? I would say, uh, I thought about this a lot because I just saw him on TV the other day on, I think it was Sports Center or something, talking to somebody, but uh, Chris Bosch. Um, really sad for him the way that things had to end with his career with the the blood clots and all having to end his career early but um, he was still even once LeBron left and even once D Wade was getting a little bit older he was kind of primed and ready to be the the real leader and sort of carry that team forward going forward from there with him and D Wade and then some some additional parts there but he was ready to go back to being that 20 and 10 type of guy maybe not exactly in the same way as he was in Toronto but um, I think even once the, the big three kind of broke up in Miami, he was sort of ready to carry that um, mantle forward as D-Wade was getting a little bit older and, and be one of the leaders and one of the most important players on that team. Uh, and then also his transformation from being the type of player he was in Toronto to coming to Miami and having a stretch all the way out to the corners and out to, to the wing to shoot threes, top of the key threes. Uh, he was tasked with guarding big men that he wasn't always necessarily the most equipped well, yeah. to guard. Uh, and they just said, hey, Chris, figure it out because we're playing small. We're going to play five, and you're going you're gonna to play a lot of the five because our best big man other than you is Birdman. Uh, Birdman, so he, he was, Birdman. Birdman, Birdman. Uh, so he did have to play a lot of the five, which was tough, but he did a good job. And then also, uh, as an offensive option, just to kind of smooth things out, if LeBron's shot wasn't falling or if Wade had to sit out a game or two with the, the knee issues, Bosch was just – there i mean in and out every week he was just the guy who's just going to show up and if you need him to give you 25 he can give you 25 if you need him to sit in the corner and go three for five from three and, and not do much else the rest of the game he'll do he'll do just that so i think people look back on that time a lot and you see so many highlights of uh you know the way to bosh understandably you see the lobs off the backboard and the them running and hugging each other after the game or that kind of stuff the steals and transition them throwing it back and forth to each other for a dunk you don't see a lot of Chris Bosh highlights, but we do not win those two championships without Chris Bosh. He hit so many big shots in the in the playoffs and even in the finals. Um, so I think he's criminally overlooked in terms of that time period. I, I don't think people even really throw his name in there when they start talking about those championships, but I think they should. That's, that's a really good point in terms of different phases of his career because you felt he was going to third phase once the big three right. got split up and it was he was leading the team. It would have been really cool to have seen, seen what him and Jimmy Butler could have done together. And another good yep. point on just the big shots because you hear players say how sometimes it's really hard to lock in offensively when all you do is just play defense. You don't necessarily get enough touches. But to stay warm and to stay ready when the ball comes to you, that that takes a, a lot of mental uh, mental strength to do. Um, yeah. that's really cool and actually it's quite uh, your points lead quite nicely to the final question which is all time starting five you mentioned Shaq is someone who's potentially overrated Chris Boss is underrated what you're building your Miami all time franchise five who would it be 
Oh man, I'm going, and this is, I mean, this is going to be a very biased starting five, but it just, it is what it is. Uh, I'm going Jason Williams, Florida, absolute Florida legend, uh, rocket number 55 there. Uh, one of the greatest Florida basketball players of all time. If, if not the greatest in college, uh, if not the greatest player we ever had, uh, changed the game. One of the most innovative point guards uh, that I had ever seen uh, at the two. I'm going D Wade at the three. I'm going LeBron at the four. I'm going Chris Bosch and at the five, this is going to be, yeah, this is probably going to put me in some hot water. I'm going Alonzo morning. I'm not going, I'm not going Shaquille O'Neal. I think prime Alonzo there for sure. I'm going him over the time that Shaq was there. Yeah. So in terms of picking, picking players at the stage of their career, they were at when they were in Miami. Yeah. I'm going, I'm going Alonzo and obviously uh, UD my six man off the bench, off the bench. Um, Of course, Mr. Man (laughs) would definitely have to be the six man. Um, And you, uh, I don't know how many, when a video is produced, I know how long it is, but first time we mentioned LeBron um, in Miami, like it feels so weird to say, oh shit, yeah, LeBron was in Miami, you won two titles. Yeah. It feels like so long ago that that happened. Um, it was. How did it you really feel when was. it was announced? Because I remember I, that sort oh, of man. Cu- couple years when I was really getting into basketball, so I didn't really understand the uh, the magnitude of what was happening. And I remember right. just seeing it in the newspaper and being like, oh, of course, well, I didn't really think of anything of it. But right. as a fan, what did you think when that happened? I, I don't think I understood it really truly at the time what like how big of an impact that was going to be and how big of a deal that was I, I knew it was a big deal obviously it's, it's LeBron James but being such a huge Dwayne Wade fan and not seeing LeBron win to that point it's weird to look at someone where you're like okay you're the best player in the league and you're a dominant player and you're dragging your team to the you know, the finals or dragging them through the playoffs every year but I don't know exactly what this is going to look like I mean you assume everything's going to go well but then, like we we're talking about earlier, Bosch was a huge figure back then and a huge, yes. like big time player. So adding all of that together into a mix, I wasn't certain exactly how I was going to look. I assumed like we're going to be great, but I didn't know exactly what it was going to look like. And I was excited, but um, I was not mentally prepared for, hey, for sure, four straight finals and for sure, at least a couple championships. Like I was hoping for the best, but um as somebody who was watching that heat team with wade and the rest of those parts that were around um after we had won that championship like those 07 to 09 years Mm -hmm. weren't that good i mean that was like a wade fringe mvp year because of how how much he had to score because the rest of the team wasn't put together all that well so uh we lost some people to to free agency and, and i think trades and stuff too but um I was worried that hey we're gonna come in and if it's gonna be wade braun and bosh and if not them who else? Cause I don't know that I trust really anybody on this team and it happened to be enough at some points and then not enough at other points. You had guys like, you know, Chalmers and other people trying to fill in some of the Norris gaps, Cole, but I um, was it was exciting. It was an exciting time. Norris Cole. I mean, Shane Badia. It was, it was an exciting time. Mike Miller, um, a very, very exciting time to be a heat fan. So that was, like you said, I think that had to have been now looking back, maybe like middle school for me, I think it was the kind of the perfect time for that to all come together. Right. When you're like a, a kid, yeah. but getting to like high school age and you're starting to really, really enjoy it, but you can still kind of go to some games too, or, or do that kind of thing. It's, it was a, uh, it was a heck of a time to be a Heat fan for sure. So let's get to the current roster and the current team. Let's, uh, let's talk about um, Miami right now. Oh, so last, yeah. last year, <laughs> quite, we have quite to? You, 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 I mean, pleasant surprise last year making it all the way to finals very miami heat in terms of strictly business all in the bubble so i want to ask you aside from jimmy buckets and bam who is miami's most valuable player um this may sound a little weird to say because they only played a couple games and we're honestly just kind of getting up to Uh, speed but i think i think victor oladipo is the absolute key to how far the season ends up going and i also don't really think that he's coming back which is also really really unfortunate see i i haven't heard enough from anyone saying that he's definitively coming back um there's been sort of conflicting reports some people are saying hey maybe it's just a few weeks maybe he may not come back the only thing i've heard out of spolstra is um we're not saying he's definitively done for the season and that's really all i've heard but i've heard nothing about progress coming back i've heard nothing about the real extent of the injury or when what his kind of timetable is um, but his defensive versatility, being able to guard the best guard in the other team and leaving Jimmy kind of free to guard 
more so the best wing or best player usually on the other team uh, is huge. Cause then at three levels defensively, which Miami's already been a, a really, really strong defensive team. They were six, fifth or sixth overall in, in defense this year, but um, it, it frees us up to have Oladipo guard, the best guard, Jimmy guard, the best wing, and then bam guard, the best big of whatever team we play. So that makes you a formidable team in the playoffs, even if you struggle uh, offensively. So I think his defensive versatility is huge, but also we need that next third piece as a score. Like we need somebody else who can give us 15 to 20. And he showed pretty quickly. And after his first couple of games, he, I think he already had a game where he had maybe 15 or something and was, was shooting it a little bit better. So I think Oladipo is absolutely the third most important and most valuable guy on that team. But I don't think he's coming back, which is tough to say. I mean, you got Tyler Hero, who's next, who's been, who's the next best thing since sliced bread. But we'll get on to him a little bit later. Um, so, who would a bit more? Don't even get me started on him. Oh God. Um, uh, who would you? Which player from Miami squad would be the guy that you most like to go on a night out with? Go out on a party, or maybe on a lash. Um, I think. Hmm. Trying to think in terms of current squad, who would I want to go? Um, Jimmy seems like a really fun guy. I just don't know exactly what his night out would look like. I feel like it could be a little weird. I, I don't no, know exactly he's into his country music, which uh, right. If, if it means going to Mavericks, that's not uh, me. Rather not. Yeah, I'm not going to Mavericks. I'm not going to yeah saddle up down here in Orlando. I'm I'm pretty much good on the the whole country uh, vibe and scene. He can he can keep that for himself, but. He, he seems like the most fun guy, I think, on the team. He seems like he would be a fun guy to hang out with for sure. I reckon he'll be down just play for you for all night and just chat shit. Yeah. Oh, um, absolutely. So who absolutely. is actually – Oh, I, I've already got an idea who this may be because I've heard you talk about – Well, okay. actually, it could be one of two people. Who is okay. a player that you think you would most clash with on the team if you were, if you were playing for Miami or if you were in the organization? Got it. I have one person outside of Miami too for the last question in terms of best night out. Do, or also, do you have somebody if you could pick anybody in the league for your uh, going out on a night out in the town? So I, one I, person popped into my head today, and I don't I've know how it took me so long to think of it because it's, it's pretty obvious before, to me. And I think I said historically, I think I thought Isaiah Thomas, uh, Detroit Pistons Isaiah Thomas would have been a really fun night out because. Well, you don't want okay. to go with someone who's fucking seven foot and you stick out like a sore thumb. Isaiah six one, he's fine, and nice high, and I think he's a That's really true. cool guy and. Um, like, I think he's just real, I can imagine he's real fun to be around. He seems like a good laugh. Um, mm-hmm. Boban would be really fun, I imagine, to go out with, but he's just so fucking tall. I don't think you, you could get a conversation. I think yeah. you have a phone to chat to him. Um, so tall. Yeah. I, I can't think of it. Uh, I haven't really thought about it too much outside of them. Who, who did you have in mind? My, my, mine is a current player, and it's based not only on their reputation off the floor, but also their recent move to a new team and the wow. city that I think would be most fun to go out in. James Harden in New York would be a hell of a night out. You combine him and his his reputation off the floor with uh with what goes down in New York, it would be a, a hell of a time. I think um, I so that would definitely be one for me. I think it was Nick Wright was talking the other day on uh, first uh, first things first. Yeah, it was like, well, we all know why James Harden was traveling with the team in Miami. It's not just because he wants to cheer from <laughs> yeah. the uh, from the stands. I'm like, oh, okay, cool, thanks, Nick. And to be fair, I did see that on exactly the point as well. A guy who recently just got traded as well now plays in Atlanta. You're assuming Mr. Lemon Pepper would also be good for that. Good for for that as well. Lemon Pepper Lou would be a fun night out. That is a um, good point. Who would I clash? All right. So who your uh, your last question? Who would I clash the most with? Um, in terms of again, if I do like kind of on my team or not on my team, on on the team, I think as much as I do love Jimmy, uh, Jimmy would probably be the most frustrating person because he demands the most uh, as a like in terms of on the court. Like uh, he would he would demand the most. And probably be the most frustrating now also the best leader and for the same yeah. reasons he's he would be equally as frustrating as he is a great leader but um i think he would be frustrating but in terms of like play style and that kind of thing um i don't know as much as much with that one in terms of not on my team players similar to jimmy i.e uh, a chris paul a rondo one mm-hmm. of the like real hard-headed motivating will yell at you and cuss you out on the floor in front of everybody person. I think that would be the type of person I would, I would clash oh, with the most. Fair. I, I thought you were going to go with, um, with Kendrick Nunn. I thought like you'd just be annoyed at a shot. Oh, I just team. hate him. Yeah, I don't I know. know that. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, I very much don't enjoy the way he plays, but um, I get I, I, now with the lack of Oladipo and looking at this team really for what it truly is, which is a, a flawed team. Uh, I understand why, 
he's there and I understand why he does what he does. I wish he did it better, but also he was a either undrafted or second round pick or something yeah, and fought his way up from like the G league. He is, he was not a, he's not a guy that you expect to come in and give you 15 to 20 a game, but on nights where we're missing Dragic and hero or just hero, or maybe hero and Duncan Kendrick will come in there and put up 20 shots and give you 21 points or something. He'll, he'll get you some points. So I get it. I don't love it, but uh, now nah, he wouldn't be the one I would clash with the most. He frustrates me, but not more than, even other players in his position. Hero frustrates me more than him now, and he's the better player, but frustrates me even more than none. So I'm just going to shoehorn a quick two-minute segment on uh, Tyler Hero. So okay. just comparing what he was doing last year to this year. So last year, 13 and a half points. This year, 15 points. Oh, fair. Percentage yeah. went up by 3% from the field. Yeah, I guess fair. Yeah. His three-point shooting, 39% last year, 34% this year. You would assume he'll be in the 40s. But I was a bit surprised by that. Um, yeah. Free throws has dropped 87% to 81% this year. Um, I did see some of the reports um, about his off the field um, yeah. uh, ventures or what right. he does off the field. That, that, that has been brought up a little bit. Just give me a quick That's a nice minute, way of putting it. Two minutes, two minutes or one minute, however you want, just run a little bit, okay. get a little bit of Tyler here out of your system. But. I am just so happy I didn't buy a Tyler Hero jersey at the end of the last season because I was so ready to, uh, as a diehard Heat fan and as somebody who uh, wasn't too sure on how he would, how good he would be coming out of college, watching him that rookie year, I was as excited as anybody is. So was very, very excited to see um, what he could do coming into this year, thought he would improve, thought all of those percentages would go up some more. Um, he has, he he looks like a completely different player in terms of he's lost some of the um i don't want to say it's like a rookie kind of syndrome but it's the it's like when rookies try to at least make sure they're doing all of the right things he seems like he's lost a little bit of that on the floor and then also in terms of off the floor sorry um he just doesn't seem to be a hundred percent like locked in to what's going on like he'll check into a game and and put up three or four bad shots in a row get pulled out and just kind of those hands up like, Hey, that's, you know, it is, it's what it is. Like I'm, I'm here. I do what I do. I'm like, you've played one and a half years of NBA basketball and you had one of those years being good. Now he's had more opportunity this year. So he's had the chance to shoot more, but he's taking worse shots, which would explain the three point percentage going down. He's hitting some more shots. I think that's probably more so just defenses respecting him, uh, respecting his three pointer from last year, a little more than they need to. So he's been able to drive and create and, and shoot a little better inside the arc this year, but three point percentage is going down because he just takes worse shots. And also I don't know that he's, I mean, the own, t the actual team is coming out and saying like, yeah, we don't think he's all that locked in off the court. We don't know that he's necessarily a hundred percent committed to like basketball first, um, which shows in the fact that his free throw percentage dips a ton. That's like confidence and focus kind of thing. That's not a, usually not a technique thing, especially not if you're a good free, uh, free throw shooter to begin with. It's not, he didn't lose his technique. He's just not, he's just not that locked in. So that's, I think that that's kind of the cause of the three point dip. Uh, I don't think he's any better defensively than he was last year. Uh, meanwhile, Duncan Robinson's taken a huge step defensively and has gotten better offensively. Nice. Uh, Nunn's taken steps defensively to get better. So other people at his position, that shooting guard to three kind of range, uh, have showed marketed improvements to certain parts of their game that require dedication, focus, and a lot of hard work. I haven't seen any of those parts of his game improve. He's, he can knock down some shots, but he did the same thing last year. He gets to take a few more shots now, so he might score a little bit more this year, but he does not look uh, like the same player he did last year. Uh, and it is frustrating and concerning to see because I was as excited as anybody coming into the season about what he was going to be. Last thing I'll ask about Tyler Hero, when um, James Harden trade talks were just flying around, Tyler Hero was involved in discussions for that. Uh, did you, what was your initial thoughts? That uh, I, I can see by your reaction that you thought, no, we've got to keep Tyler. I'm assuming you, a little bit of you I'm assuming a little bit of you regrets that now. Just, Where? Uh, who said that? Who, who would have said such a thing? Who would have said, who would have said something so silly as that? Um, one of my points in the argument of not trading Tyler Hero in the, in the packet for Harden was I knew it wouldn't be a, a straight up trade. It would be, hey, yeah. trade Hero, some firsts, some seconds, maybe also Duncan and maybe some other stuff. So it was never don't just specifically trade just hero for him. Obviously, if that's a straight up swap, it's, you'd be an idiot not to say to trade him. But um, a couple of the points for me was was that I didn't want to give up such a huge bundle, including him in terms of losing future picks, 
losing other people on the team that I liked, like uh, Duncan or at the time I thought Precious was going to be good. He's turned out to be pretty close to a bust as well. But anyways, moving on from that, uh, I didn't want to give up a huge, huge uh, bundle of picks and and players for Harden, uh, especially not when I didn't know with him coming up to the end of his deal being at the end of the year, I didn't know that he'd want to resign and he'd want to stay. So I thought, is it worth leveraging our whole future and getting rid of, say, Hero, Duncan, a first and a second to get Harden for potentially a year and maybe lose to either Brooklyn, Philly, the Lakers, another team out west? Uh, who knows? I mean, we've basically completely written off Milwaukee at this point for for good reason, but they're still a good team. So I, I was wondering, is it worth trading all that away to get a player that we don't know if he's really going to stay for more than a year? Um, and also don't know how commit – I mean – you watched him the first couple of weeks of the year in Houston. He looked like somebody who didn't give a damn about basketball, staying in shape, working hard, any of that kind of stuff. He kind of just quit. And I'm like, that's just not the guy I want to give up our whole future in, uh, in Duncan and, and Hero or, or Bam and Hero or something like that for Harden. I just didn't want to do it at the time. Yeah. Now looking back, yeah, you could have Hero. You could have none. You could have some picks. You could have really whatever you want. Now I would want to keep Duncan probably even more so that I'd want to keep hero, but you, you could have had, yeah, looking back, I would have taken a one-year rental on Harden. Give us, give us Harden, Jimmy and Bam and maybe Ooh. still Duncan. I think that would have been the best team in the East this year. So uh, I think looking back, yeah, I would, I would have done it. Yeah. Maybe for Harden's sake, it's a good thing he didn't get traded to Miami because woo, he would not have got any sleep. <laughs> Talk about it. Hey, he'd be wearing this vice, this vice out every night. He would be, diving into his vices and at every vice night type of thing you can you can think of he would be in prime james harden form like i said off the off the court would be one of the most fun people to hang out with miami would be a place he would he would thrive don't get dumped don't get dumped brandon don't get dumped in the world yeah. in the words of Bin, Bin, Bin simmons bill simmons no i've heard um, I, allegedly as i say on our podcast oh, yes allegedly. fuck i forgot that's your thing allegedly allegedly, allegedly. allegedly. No, no, yeah no, no. Every, allegedly i don't know about miami what is i don't even people talk but about it miami. it sounds fun I, but yeah, I mean, if anything, Where Mel should know that? more. Yeah. She is a Miami girl, so Mel should know more than you do. That's why when I go there, I stay holding her hand and walking around and just kind of, she takes me to the places that we should go as a couple, and I just stay on my best behavior and just uh, yes, you know, kind of walk along and check yeah. out the sights and, and sounds and scenery. And, oh, wow, that place does look interesting. That's uh, quite quite interesting over there. Good 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 views. Yeah. So um, we spoke, so let's ran it off for this season um i was having a look at just okay. i want to compare what was happening last year and this year so last year before the playoffs started miami was seventh in offensive rating this year they're 24th um last year they were 12th in defensive rank rating this year they're seventh um and so going into the playoffs like the one thing i always want to look at is pace last year miami were a second had the second lowest pace I'm oh, sorry, last year they had the fourth lowest pace and this year they've got the second lowest pace. And the pace they're playing at this year is quite similar to the pace they were playing in the playoffs last year, which I find quite interesting. So I just want to ask you overall what you think has gone well so far this year and what you feel optimistic about heading into the playoffs and what don't you feel is optimistic heading to the playoffs? Could you give me the, the offensive rating again? Yeah. What, what that dip was? So last year uh, you were seventh in offensive rating at 112 and this year you're 24th mm. at 109. Um, so that would be the, the the main key as to what I'm concerned about or what hasn't gone as well, uh, kind of self-explanatory there. Uh, I'll start with the positive. Defensively, um, we have been just as locked in as we were kind of in the playoffs last year almost. I feel like that's sort of carried uh, from the bubble all the way through until now. We played really well defensively throughout the year. That's a, a Jimmy thing. That's a BAM thing. As individual defenders, they're really strong. But again, like I said, improvements to Duncan's defense, um, Kendrick Nunn's defense, a couple other players. Uh, Iggy's been serviceable, at least on the defensive side of the ball. So um, we've been a really good defensive team this year. So that's encouraging to know that we can keep ourselves in games by keeping the score low, uh, which kind of ties mm-hmm. into the the pace that you spoke about. We slow it down and we really grind out some of these games, which is uh, frustrating at times to win games against, a, you know, a Minnesota or, a, you know, teams of, of that nature or of that caliber, uh, Houston, Washington. We beat teams like that, you know, 102 to 98 i'm like man we really can't score more than 102 points on that team but um so that's that was that's the positive we really can can turn games into a grind and that's sort of what suits this team uh the negative and the downside to that is the reason that it suits that you know our team and the reason that suits our style is because we struggle so much offensively um that if we start getting up and down with teams and running a lot and if we were to pick up that pace and really try to push it 
Um, if teams were to go on any kind of 15 0 run, 12 0 run, that kind of thing, it's so hard for us to scrap back into games because uh, we don't have that third real score. Like, uh, like I was talking about with Oladipo, we have Duncan who can score and shoot with the best of them. But uh, if Jimmy, Bam, and Duncan aren't all on the floor at the same time, which you can only do that for a certain amount of time in a game, um, with Dragic being hurt a lot of this year, none being in and out hurt. Hero being on whatever planet he's on, he was supposed to be the third, the third piece. Um, it's really, really tough when you just have one guy being a shooter in Duncan, who's again become a more well-rounded player this year, but still primarily a three-point shooter. Jimmy's really the only one creating a lot in that offense, with Dragic being kind of banged up or just completely out of the team. Um, so we're still really missing a third guy who can kind of create and set up the offense and do their own thing. Bam is unbelievable at it. Jimmy also knows exactly what to do and, and knows how to slow it down and, and do what he does. But uh, we're just kind of missing some some extra spark. We don't have that that same level of umph offensively that it seemed like we kind of had a little bit of that, a little bit of a danger factor to us in the playoffs. There was like, oh, that's the team you don't really want to play. And then it turned into a real run all the way to the finals. That was sparked by Jimmy, Bam, Hero was playing well. Um, Duncan was shooting really well, but this year there's just not that offensive spark. And I think it's just, we're honestly just missing a guy. Like we just need one more guy that can really come in and, and do that. So that's back to that earlier point of Oladipo. I think that's why that hurts so much. Cause I think him, him, if he was at 85, 90% even uh, pair that with Jimmy and Bam and the way that Duncan's played this year, if hero could even kind of get his act together and really tighten up come playoff time, I think that we'd still be a really dangerous team just like last year, but I don't, I don't see it happening this year. I, I see a much lower ceiling on this season than I did last season. That was going to be my follow-up. So let's say, for example, um, the odds are the same for every round, and you have to put a tenner on for Miami, and you have to bet where you think they will be knocked out or what okay. stage or if they're going to win it. Where where do you see – where would you put your tenner on if all odds are the same? Um, I think it is going to be – this is kind of a cop-out, but I think it kind of depends on uh, where we end up falling in terms of seeding. Uh, if we fall to that seven or eight seed and get into the play in and have to play a, a Brooklyn or a Philly or somebody like that yeah. in the first round, uh, I could see us losing the first round. But uh, if we find a way to work ourselves back up to that five or six spot and avoid uh, the play in game and play maybe like a three seed, that would be what Milwaukee. maybe like Milwaukee or, you reckon or, you can uh, beat Milwaukee? Uh, or the Knicks or something. I mean, no one would have thought we could have last year and it was not even close. I mean, it was an absolute beat down last year. So I'd feel I'd feel pretty good about playing them more so than anybody else because again, mind you, the best part about our team is that would be the most important for that matchup. The most important yeah. part of being Milwaukee is slowing down one man, and we know how to do that as well as anybody, and we actually executed on that as well as anybody last year. So that gives me confidence, even if our offense uh, kind of sucks at times. So I, I wouldn't be as worried about Milwaukee as I would um, either a Philly or. Um, Brooklyn, Philly, because of their size. I mean, bam, love him to death. The guy's been unbelievable, but uh, he's six, all of six, nine six and nine. a half. I'm surprised. Be generous. Yeah. Embiid is a full on seven foot, about 270, 280, and he is a tank down there to handle. So getting bam in foul trouble or getting other people in foul, we don't have a real, like, legitimate anchor as a big, as, as a center. We don't have, I see it on your face. You're like, who even is your, I was say, who's we, your backup we don't have one. So, uh, we just picked up Dwayne Deadman from uh, working at Jiffy Lube, uh, and he's come in and played the last. Uh, oh gosh! Yeah, I mean, Deadman yeah, Orlando. Dwayne Deadman. What a classic, uh, like NBA two K player. You'd pick him up on like free agency and add him to your team for some depth. He'd always be like the best free agent who hasn't been on a team in like two years, kind of guy. Um, but no, so he and he's honestly funny enough. He's come in and played really, really well. Probably, out, I bet he averages five points and five or six boards. But he comes in and just protects the rim, grabs a few like important mm -hmm. rebounds, can can catch a lob here or there, can can get a dunk here or there. Um, so he's been really, really strong. But um, back to our ceiling, um, I think our size on the interior is, is going to be an issue. And then also injuries and and our guards kind of taking a step back in terms of Dragic doesn't look like the same player. Hero doesn't look like the same player. None looks like the same player, which is a problem. Um, so I think, I think, uh, if we run into one of those top two seeds in the first round, I think it could be a first round exit, but, um, I think it all really depends on the matchup. I could also see us playing somebody like Milwaukee and winning, um, and then getting to that second round and it being 
I guess it would really have to be either Philly or Brooklyn at yeah. that point. So I don't, I don't know. I think am I, if I had to put, put all my money on the table, I'd say a second round hard fought exit and just yeah. kind of a, a burnout in terms of a lack of offensive production. And we're out in the second round, I think. That's a, that's a great point in Embiid because just thinking that's the only real elite center in the playoffs within the East and no one can really guard him. And it's a poor matchup for everyone. You're just assuming that yep. maybe Brooklyn will outscore them, um, which links actually quite nicely to the final part of the, oh, not the final part, to the next part, which is the six man okay. playoff draft. So as you know, uh, the five GMs have been battling for the, the first pick in the playoff draft. <laughs> and of course. Uh, it's rhetorical to say who's top been leading since week one you know it's i mean we all know that if anybody's tuned in to, to the six man to this point yeah. you, know, you know who reigns supreme uh, at the top of the and it's it's just a bit unfair because i mean we all saw it when golden state were on the historic run it's just it's just too easy it's not fun to watch i understand like the viewing it, figures aren't there just because house last is just dominating and it's just not fun to watch but you know it is what it some is fans, some fans don't like dynasties you know but i think that that does power the the league and it, it creates a villain character for people to either root for or root against so and that's that's kind of what you've established earlier on it's, it's tough in these streets it's tough in these streets so it what is. i want to ask you is i need some advice okay i don't know who i'm going to pick for my first pick because i've got questions about every single team um so we've got the playoffs coming up i want to hear your top six teams that you'd want to take so number one who you would take as your first pick if that was going your second pick up to number six so we've got a pick for each six men so how do you think mock draft season how do you think okay. the six man mock draft will go to win the championship Okay. Um, I think mm, if we had to pick it today, it is tough with some of the injuries and things still floating around. I still think I have my number one team until somebody actually shows me they'll beat them uh, as the Lakers. I think I'm still picking them one. I think a healthy AD and a healthy LeBron, which it seems like they're kind of getting back to, to being healthy. Um, you got to show me you can beat a, a healthy LeBron with a legitimate superstar next to him before I believe that, that someone's going to beat him. And that's why I'm going think first pick. It's just a healthy LeBron. I think it's a rested LeBron as well, which is why I'm swaying a little bit towards the Lakers as well. But okay, that's yep. your first pick. Who's your second that pick? That is. Um, second pick, I think, would be Brooklyn. Yeah. I think uh, regardless of some of the lack of, of defense and some of the atrocious defensive numbers, um, I feel like it just would be really difficult to say they're not going to score – 120 points a game and i mean they're scoring 130 140 in some games now i know it slows down a, a bit in the playoffs but i don't see anybody really slowing them down to the point where they're not scoring 115 plus and that's just not something that most other teams can can do even if they are giving up a lot of points i mean slowing down for them that just means half court half court offense which right is their better offense than their fast break exactly. yeah, they're a better half court team than really probably any team other than again you could probably argue LA with with a fully healthy LeBron and AD that that two man duo is kind of insane but efficiency wise uh, you know offensive rating and all the like advanced analytics that kind of stuff the Nets are doing stuff that I think even Golden State wasn't doing in the last few years I mean they are they are setting some record type of efficiency numbers um, that's going to be a problem so I think yeah I think that they'd be my second pick so we've got the two big dogs out of the way who is your third pick this is where it could get interesting so we've had the Trevor Lawrence and Zach Wilson pick who's your third pick that is interesting. That's where this draft, the NFL draft coming up here in a few hours for those uh, listening, that that's where this will get interesting too, is that actual third pick. Um, are, we, are we going for a Mac Jones, think, Trey Lance, a Justin Fields? <laughs> I hope you don't end up calling this a Mac Jones type pick. Um, I think, I think from what I've seen this year, because I have actually watched a good amount of this team, I think Philly. Yeah. I think the one, uh, yeah. with with how good MB has played, yeah. and uh, with some of the other additions that they have, um, and some of the other the, the new players they have, I don't see anybody really slowing like their whole offense together down. When you consider MB kicking out to some of the shooters they have now, um, Tobias, I haven't looked up his numbers, but I assume he's played well. I mean, they don't they don't you know go go as well as they've been going this year. I think without him not playing well, uh, I looked up quickly: twenty points, seven rebounds, four assists. Great year out of Tobias. Um, so a really good year out of him. Ben Simmons, he is what he is. Uh, he's great at exactly what he does. You just need to not expect him to be a give you 20 points guy. He's just not that guy. Or to ever shoot from outside the restricted area. He's just not gonna, he's not gonna shoot it from any further away than the block, but that's that's okay. But um, them defensively, Ben Simmons, I think, is like a defensive player of the year candidate. Embiid, really strong rim protector, and them as a one-two punch offensively. I think outside of Brooklyn has got to be the most scary offensive team 
in the East because there's just no, like you said, there's no real answer for Embiid. I mean, what do you do to slow that down? He can get 30 on anybody he really wants. And then defensively, they have, you know, real defensive players. And like I said, with with Seth shooting the way he is, and well, he always has, but Seth playing as well as, as he has and Tobias having a really good year, I think offensively they're as potent as they have been really ever. I think it's finally kind of clicking now under under Doc a little bit, a little bit more than usual. Um, I think they're good enough defensively. They could really give some people some problems. You throw Ben Simmons on a, a Harden or a, a KD or something like that. You could you could at least make it difficult on them. So yeah. I think they're they're the third best. That'd be my third pick. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, so again, on the center thing as well. If if we're taking the top eight right now, excluding Ban, the next best center is probably Clint Capella in the East. Which that's funny. Um, do you consider that's yeah. See, in, in college, you would have been an undersized center in uh, in Julius Randle, but I guess you consider him more like uh, a four. Yeah, he's, he's now, four because yeah, then um, yeah. Noel um, plays center now for the Knicks. And oh, who's the other guy? Yeah. Oh, um, Tom Ro- Robinson the young guy. got injured. Yeah, he got Robinson, injured. Robinson, Mitchell Robinson, yeah. Yeah, he's injured. Is he out? Is he out now? Yeah, he's injured. Yeah, now. he was out. <laughs> I mean, he's and Obi Topin hasn't really done anything. He's <laughs> four points a game, I think, which is... Obi. Oh. So we've got Lakers one, Nets two, Philly three. Who do you have at the fourth pick? At the fourth pick, I have this. This may actually surprise you. I have the Phoenix Suns. That's a good one. Wadi will be pleased with that. We've spoken a lot about the Phoenix Suns. We feel, we feel very confident I, in them. I very much like them. I haven't got to see a ton of their games because they're usually late night, obviously yes. West Coast. Um, so them for for me, I think those games are usually tipping off around ten or ten thirty. Um, so just on weeknights when I have work and stuff, I'm usually not starting a game at ten or eleven and staying up till one to finish it. But um, the way Chris Paul has played, the way that's helped Booker play, his stat, Booker's stats haven't gone up really at all, not like noticeable to the eye. They're kind of around the same, I think. But um, he just looks so comfortable, which is the difference to me, is that he's scoring and doing the same things he was doing last year, but with only 60% of kind of the burden on his shoulders is what he had last year, was shouldering the full you know, brunt of that team and the, the weight of the responsibility. That's kind of off of him now. I think Chris Paul kind of assumes that position assumes that role when he comes into a team and, and people kind of put that on him and trust him in that. Uh, so I think that's freed up Booker and also Aiton to be mm-hmm. a lot more just confident and comfortable in what they're doing. Uh, and then some of the other pieces around them too, like I said, I haven't got to see a lot of their games, but um, some of the other guys I like on that team too, when watching them play, they look very well put together again, defensively pretty strong. Um, them pace wise, they can kind of go at a faster pace or really slow it down because you have yeah. Chris, Chris Ball obviously yeah. in the half court. So, uh, but they got some young guys and they have some shooters and stuff, so they can kind of run at times when they when they see fit. But um, no, I just like them. He seems like such a great leader and such a great player. That's always been like he's kind of always struck me as the guy who should win. It just hasn't necessarily worked out for him to win. But he seems like a winning type player. It just hasn't necessarily worked out. And I. I'd, I'd never have loved him particularly, but you can't doubt like what yeah. it is that he can do on the floor. So I think, I think he's going to drag them into potentially like a Western conference finals with, uh, with LA, I think. Some very interesting points there. We love Phoenix on the six man. Um, they've got one of the best bench units in the league. Dario Sarch is there on the bench who I really, really like, especially coming off the bench was a nice role for him. Mikhail Bridges mm-hmm. is having a breakout year. Um, yep. Uh, shoot, doing really, really well for Phoenix. Yeah. Oh, Cameron Payne. I can believe really Payne's been playing well. Yeah. Um, and on, he killed Miami the other night. God, he ate us alive. I just always remember him in Oklahoma with the handshakes with Russell Rushbrook. It's nice to see yeah. him like get to play with Chris Ball. And even on the Chris right. Ball point, I wasn't necessarily the biggest fan of him with the Clippers. Felt very whiny and not very likable. But yeah. his time in even in Houston, you start to be like, okay, cool. But then in OKC and in Phoenix, now you're like, wow, I think he's becoming very, very yeah. lovable and really, really nice for him. Yep. You really see his quality shining through. And then linking on to the Devin Booker point, we had spoken previously on the six man about, um, I've mentioned previously about Devin Booker's post-ups. I think he's got the second most post-ups for any guard in the league. I think he might have maybe number one. Yes, because I was looking at Chris Middleton and wow. the only player with more, more post-ups was Devin Booker. So he really utilizes that. I think he's got the most points per possession from a post-up out of any guard, um, which again, okay. for half-court offense is what you need. And what you're saying in terms of Devin Booker's stats saying the same, that is really good for him because the narrative on Devin Booker was always uh, good stats, bad team. Like you'll get all these numbers, right. but the team ain't winning and they're right. not, he's not taking Phoenix anywhere. So the fact that he is maintaining that and Phoenix are doing much better, credit to him as well. So I think Phoenix is a, it's a team we're all sort of eyeing. We'll see, we'll see where it goes in the playoff draft. We're really excited to see where Phoenix goes. Last two picks. Yeah. 
So you've got two east, two west. Um, fifth pick. Fifth pick, and I don't like this team, but I just I I don't see any way that I could keep them out of at least the five best teams if they actually get their act together a little bit uh, as the Clippers. Yeah, it's just yeah. it's too much with with Paul George and you just with Paul George, Kawhi, and the rest of a team who you would assume could play good defense. Now, again, their defensive rating and defensive numbers, I don't think have actually been that impressive this year. I, I looked at some of that the other day. Mm-hmm. It hasn't been great, but you got to figure that in a West where the big two, if you will, from most of the teams they're going to be competing with for that Western Conference title or Western Conference finals at birth, at least, uh, would be Utah. So Donovan Mitchell and, and Gobert, advantage Paul George and, and Kawhi. Uh, Phoenix, Chris Ball and Booker, um still just in terms of talent and on paper at this point i think it's pretty close but i I, if they both play their very best i think again advantage Kawhi and and paul george i think Kawhi is the best player out of those four Uh, and then pg is probably the third maybe out of those out of those four guys so um so and then maybe denver you had Jokic and jamal murray but now no murray that pretty much eliminates them out of contention for me i don't i don't see them doing anywhere near as much as i thought they would Oh, when they have Hold him, on. they got and Aaron Gordon. Maybe Aaron Gordon a... solves all their problems. They've got Aaron Gordon now. That solves all their problems that they right, have. Right, right. You know, you know what happens when you pick up magic players that takes you straight into the finals. Fuck you, Brandon. Right. Um, <laughs> so, um, Chicago, so yeah, but that would have been a really, uh, yeah, well, yeah, that's a good point. I like Vooch. I always like Vooch. Yeah, no, I'm not I gonna do that to Vooch. Well, yeah, um, I ain't gonna dog in. Sorry, sorry. I, I like him a lot. Um, but yeah, just in terms of those those two man combos that they're playing against yeah. in the West, out of all those big two for like those top four or five teams, they probably have like the second best one. So I just I don't know how I can keep them out of at least the top five. I don't like them, and I loved watching them just absolutely melt down last year. It was a blast for me to watch, uh, especially somebody who's pulling for LeBron. I've always liked him. I think he gets a lot of not necessarily unwarranted criticism. He's one of the most popular people in the world. He's going to get criticized for anything and everything, but um, kind of unnecessary stuff sometimes with some of the the hate that he gets. So yeah. as somebody who was pulling for him as the we- a Western team last year, I wanted to play LA. I was like, I'd love to see a Heat Lakers, like one of my favorite players in LeBron versus my favorite team in Miami. I can't wait for that finals. Um, so I was pulling heavily against the Clippers last year and it was just loved it. Yeah. It was absolutely beautiful to watch it. them just absolutely melt down. It was funny. So um, hoping for the same again, but if they were to put it together, I think they're one of the five ish best teams. Couple so, couple points we've made about the Clippers throughout the year. One, they are unable to defend point guards. They they let up so many big big scoring nights to point guards when in when Reggie Jackson is playing. Um, I mean, there's only so much you can do, and they struggled at times. And even defending the center position when Serge Ibaka is out, and they're maybe relying on Morris or Patrick Patterson to play the center position. That's also where it can sometimes yeah. get killed. But that will only necessarily really happen against Denver. It seems in this scenario, and they're not that big. <laughs> So though yeah, they're not big. Yeah. On the positive side, you're hoping if it from a Clippers perspective, playoff Rondo comes out to play and really gives a mentality shift yeah. to the two wing players there. And both Kawhi and PG are averaging 50 40 night are in the 50 40 night club, which is great for them. And we yeah. know they can score the lights out. The final thing is also we mentioned about on the show about their late game execution. It's just sometimes not there. It's just so ISO yeah. ball, but never necessarily in a good way. It's just yeah. very forced and nothing, never a shot that you're like, okay, cool. We'll take that shot. Yeah. I don't, I don't love their role players. I love their core of, of PG and, and Kawhi. And again, I don't even love uh, PG in terms of as a playoff performer, obviously, but in terms of on paper, you have to love them too, as a, as a duo, but I just, I mean, yeah, where are you at, Patrick Beverly? Well, you've just been talking all that shit for years, and now you, I mean, you can't even guard anybody anymore or score. So where are you at? Have you point? seen that video of, like, when Patrick Beverly is trying to trash talk Steph Curry, and Patrick was like, it's my time now. And, and Steph Curry's like, aren't you, like, 29? Like, yeah. what are you on about? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Mr. Bennett, we've had five picks. Your final pick, no Utah, no Milwaukee, no Mavs so far. One of these three teams are going to miss out. Who is your sixth pick? I can't believe I'm saying this with Utah being the, the number one overall team, but I really just don't trust. I don't trust them. I know it's something about it that I, I, I don't so. trust. I don't trust it. I, and I love Donovan Mitchell is probably one of my now three or four favorite players in the NBA. He reminds me a lot of a young D Wade at times, a uh, much better shooter than a young D Wade, but um, reminds me of him in terms of his athletic ability, slashing creativity. Some of the stuff he does is just play style. He reminds me of him. Um, but um 
Yeah, I God. I think I do have to put them in there. I was gonna I was gonna leave them out, uh, but I feel like it was gonna completely contradict my I thought I was gonna completely contradict my uh my earlier uh statements about my own my own beloved Miami Heat, but I would have loved to throw this in there as at least somewhat still in the mix, but I just, I don't see it. Unless, unless Oladipo comes back now, again, a fully healthy Oladipo, um, give me Miami at six. I think we're back in the mix. If we add one more piece that can really do something offensively, stop you there. I think we're back. Yeah. Knicks are ahead of you in the play, in the playoff rankings. I'm just saying that I'm taking the Knicks over in Miami. the seating, but they're not. The no, no, team. I'm taking them. I'm taking over the title. I'm taking, I am all in on the Knicks train. That's, have... that's a terrible pick. <laughs> That's, if you t- if you pick the Knicks in your top six, you you should retire no, from no, this. Uh, I'm not picking okay, top okay. six. I'm hoping they fall to me in the um, third round. I'm hoping to get them third round. But... Nah, but I'll I'll pick Utah. I'll throw Utah in there. If um if Denver was if they still had Jamal Murray, I think I would have gone Denver. I love Jokic. Um, I like Michael Porter Jr. a lot. Yeah. yeah um, yeah. some of their other guys I don't trust as much. Some of their bench guys and kind of ancillary pieces, but um uh, Jamal Murray, awesome, awesome to watch. Was playing really well again playing great i think going into the injury i believe was kind of on a hot hot streak yeah. again so him and Jokic would have made them my put them in my top six but uh utah yeah it's disrespectful to not give the number one overall seed in the entire league at least a, a shot in that top six but i don't know what it is it's something about i, I just i think oh. about them in the playoffs not in the regular season i think about you got donovan mitchell and rudy gobert as your two best players in a potential western conference finals where they're either going against Chris Paul, Devin Booker, and Aiton, or Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, or the more likely scenario, LeBron James and Anthony Davis. Do you really think that Utah team is going to beat that team four times in seven games? I just don't. I don't see it. Even if they do have the better bench and the better depth, which they do, I just don't think that that big two is enough to really. I don't think Mitchell can do it by himself, and I think those other teams have a better big two than their big two. So couple, I just I don't think they're gonna have it. A couple points to defend Utah and a little bit on the Mavs. Both of them played in seven game series last year in the playoffs. Utah could have easily won that series against Denver. And this is a Denver team which a lot of people are high on. Playoff Jamal Murray and playoff uh, Donovan Mitchell were going at it. Yeah. Some historical performances. Like that'll be spoken about years from now in terms of their battle. So maybe we see another appearance of Donovan um, of playoff Mitchell. And even Mavericks as well. They there were a couple but a bounce of the ball away from beating the Clippers um, in that seven game series. Paul Zingas got uh, ejected for that stupid decision. And um, I remember, and yep. Mavs could have easily have won that series as well. So I thought they were going to, I really wanted them to because our oh, skip was just, oh, really, I too. oh my Lord. But yeah. I would have loved okay. it. Anyways, um, I, yeah. going into the season as a caveat in terms of uh, my, my disrespect here for the Mavs by leaving them out uh, going into the season, I would have picked them as if you would have said like, who's your one sleeper team coming into 2021 uh, that fully healthy, who would be a team that you think could make it to, or even win a championship. I would have thought Luca continues to take another step yeah. forward and the rest of the team kind of builds a little bit around him. I think if they you know add a guy here or there, I think they could be that team. They just started so slow this year. Yeah. Luca wasn't ready for the season. They said he was really like not, uh, prepared he thought the season was going to start later so he didn't seem really fully fit i guess at the start of the year but uh they're coming on strong now but they just they started so slow and so some part of that's kind of nagging at me the back of my mind i'm like are they the team from kind of earlier on where they're not as good as we thought they were yeah. going to be or are they the team that they have been for the last month or so where they look really good again but um i don't know luca can win you a game on any night but can he win you four games against a, a more experienced player like chris paul like a phoenix yeah. or a lakers or uh, one of those teams, that's the, the question for me. If things stay how they are, it will be another repeat of last year's first round series of Mavs versus Clippers. So that would be, I, I, I always like that sort of comparison one year. I would love that. Other, but. So that's, I would love to see that matchup again. That is your um, top six pick. So you've got Lakers at number one, Nets at number two, uh, so, Nets at number two, Sixers at number three, Phoenix at number four, Clippers at five, and Utah at six. Solid, solid picks i'll definitely take that in consideration when you know a man has to pick his first pick so of course thank you for that um, of course now do you all have your established order already in terms of what what your picks are going so to be or it looks like the way it's going to end this year i've already got the highest percentage i probably will be number one right. number two and three there's three games between um wildy and jordan jordan who's been second okay. for the whole year while he's really catching up dallas yep. are one of his teams phoenix are one of his teams uh philly are one of his teams so they've really been picking up pace recently and jordan's lakers have been had some injury issues portland haven't yeah. been as good so his couple teams are slipping uh, matt is probably going to be fourth and then bray who is in fifth we've got a rule where 
if he goes below 400, so that's 20 more wins, he needs 20 more wins, he has to forfeit his pick to Alex. So Alex will jump up to the pick number five. Bray has got okay. Timberwolves, the Kings, he picked up the Heat, Celtics, um, all disappointing team. He picked up Houston. I think Houston was his first round pick because he thought his thinking was yeah exactly his thinking was uh, it's not that crazy it's not that crazy but it just worked out to be so sad i mean what was the thought process um well even if they trade trade james harden they're gonna get someone like ben simmons back so they're still gonna be good so i'm just gonna pick houston i'm like okay cool take houston (laughs) you would think you would you would think Um, i remember people picking washington to be great at the beginning of the year Yes. People saying, oh, well, you got Russ, you got, you have Rabelia, blah, blah, blah. I'd throw that in as another, I mean, you know, me being the, the pessimistic guy sometimes that I am, at least on our podcast, it's not really me as a person, but that's how I am sometimes as a, as a personality, just for fun, just for, for entertainment value. But um, throw that in there as one last little uh, tidbit, unwarranted. But one of my most overrated players, one of the people that I've shifted my thought process on the most, somebody that I used to absolutely love, and now somebody that I've just really, really oh. gotten tired of is Westbrook. I just, I, I've lost all sense of the man. He just plays so hard and God, he's just so passionate. And he's so, I'm like, it is annoying to watch him play. He doesn't have a lot of, um, of self-awareness in terms of what he does. Well, he takes more and more threes every season and shoots them at a worse and worse clip. And I think this year is one of his worst ever, if not his worst ever three point shooting year, he's been worse and worse the last few years. He keeps doing things that he knows he can't do just out of blind, irrational confidence. And just like, People chalk it up to, ah, he's just so he's just so passionate. He just cares so much. I'm like, well, then he should care to work on his three some more so that he doesn't, you know, continue jacking up 40 footers and then losing games at the end of games. People want to chalk it up to like, oh, he's carrying them now. Look at look at their hot streak. It's it's Russell, it's Russell Westbrook. I'm like, so have you not watched what Bradley Beal's done over the course of the last few weeks? He's averaging like 32 points a game. So 31 points a game. And he has basically all season. So it, it it frustrates me the triple double thing that's a whole nother conversation for another day but um yeah he's he's definitely the the one for me that's the that's, triple that's double thing one. is something i brought up uh, pre, uh about a month or so ago saying is the fact that he's doing this now oh what's up chris that's chris is here yeah yeah i see i got it i got it from the, <laughs> um <laughs> the, uh, the triple double thing it's just something i brought up previously in terms of the fact that he's doing this four or five years in a row, doesn't it sort of a little bit diminish when he did it over that season? Maybe if like a one-off thing he it, did in a season, it sort of it, looks a bit better now. Sort of it like. does. It does. And if you look at some of the numbers in terms of, and I hate throwing this on him because a lot of people have a high usage rate, but yeah. usage rate wise, and in terms of like the ball, the possessions that he has the ball in his hands, people are like, oh, well, I mean, if he, if, if everybody could do it, why aren't they all doing it? I'm like, well, they don't all have the ball in their hands 85 out of the hundred possessions a game. Like, yeah, you think that LeBron has that a lot. Half the time, LeBron comes up the court and just tries to set up AD, yeah, yeah. feeds him in the post, or he, he'll he make the hockey assist and throw it to somebody else for an extra pass. And like, oh, God, look at Westbrook again with 10 rebounds. I'm like, he's grabbing a rebound when everybody clears out or boxes out for him to get a rebound so that he can just start the fast break, which, again, that's not a bad strategy as yeah, a team. Exactly. Let him get the board and let him take off on a fast break. Exactly. Great, by all means. That makes sense. But I'm not going to be blown away or go gaga over the fact that he had – 10 rebounds in a game when they're clearing out and letting him get rebounds or the fact that if he's the one starting the possession with the ball in his hands and creating and driving head down into a group of defenders and even throwing it out of bounds or kicking it out to a three-point shooter that he would end up with 10 threes a game if he does that for 80 percent of their possessions and you have a somewhat decent shooting team around you yeah you should be able to get 10 assists in a game and i think a lot of a lot of guards maybe wouldn't get the rebound numbers because they wouldn't be that aggressively fighting for all those rebounds throughout the course Mm -hmm. of the game which Credit to him, he does do that, and he plays unbelievably hard and aggressive. Um, but from an assist standpoint, like I bet there's ten guards in the league that if they brought the ball up every single time of the court, and their sole point and focus was like drive and kick, drive and kick, drive and kick, they would end up with ten assists a game. If they had the ball that much in their hands, it would it would happen. It's not that crazy of a stat to have ten assists. My ideal scenario now is that Miami come up against Washington in the um, playing tournament and you get to eat some of that humble pie and Westbrook just goes. I would love Damn. that matchup. Would love that. Would love to see them in the the plan, the plan shenanigans, whatever it's going to be. I'm like not worried him. about it. I'm worried about my guy Beal. I'd be worried about him. He scares me. But other than that, no, I'm bothered. So we're going to end this off with one of my favorite things to do, and it's to test 
have a bit have a bit of a fondle on your Miami Heat knowledge and something actually you brought up a little bit earlier. Okay. So we're going to play step up to the line. The way it works is that I'm going to give you a category and you can say names from that category. So if you say one, I'll say a point. Uh, there's no time gotcha. limit. Um, and every correct answer is a point. However, if you say an incorrect answer, you lose all your points, you go to zero and it's game over. So I'm looking for quality yeah. answers that are right. I'm not looking for quantity. I'm just looking for the quality answers. Now, okay. The category is it's almost, you, almost almost like a family feud thing. Like the popular answer is the correct answer, or is it fact just fact based in terms of the answer? Just fact based. So the the okay. category is the Miami Heat roster that won the chip in two thousand and five, two thousand and six. So there's fifteen players. How many of those players can you name before getting one wrong? You can stop at any time. You can say I want to stop here, and you can secure those points. But let's see how many you can get. So I've got hmm. the squad list up here. Feel oh, free boy. to shoot your first name whenever you're ready. Can I phone a friend? Uh, I c- Only utilizing people that are in the room with me. We can ask Chris at the end. All right, fine. Actually, you know what? Actually, let's have a bit of fun. Can Chris go outside of the room and then we'll get him to do exactly the same quiz a bit, quiz a bit later? Well, he can't hear your question, so I think he it's it's ah. going to be a, a, a new question for him either, either way because he wouldn't he wouldn't know what you're asking me at this point. But then he may say and some he, of the names that you say. True. But th- those at this point, thinking back about it now, that's probably going to be some of the most obvious. Well, it's not going to be as many as I would have, as I would have hoped. Um, okay. I can start off the list. Um, yeah, I mean, he's got me in a, in, a, in a game show type scenario here that's going to be difficult for me, but it is what it is. Um, I mean, obviously, Dwayne Wade, yep. Shaquille O'Neal. Yeah. Um, Udonis Haslam. Uh, James Posey. Oh, yes, yes. Haslam Posey, yeah. Yep, yep. Posey. Um Give me what's the other name? Um, I wanted to say, yeah, Gary Payton. Yes. Um, hmm. I'm trying to think, trying to think some of the bench guys. I'm trying to think some of the other. Um, oh fuck, what's the name? <laughs> I should have at least at least five or six, but I'm trying. Um, hmm. Oh, well, Alonzo. Yes. So there. Um, let's see here. Mm, what's that? About five? Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, six. I'm gonna stop there and keep my points. Oh, what? A there's definitely, th- there's definitely, there's definitely some more, but I feel like the next. The next couple I was going to go to, I didn't know far right. What if I was to tell you, you only mentioned 50% of the Gators in the squad? Mm. Jason Williams. <laughs> Too, oh, late. Too late. Too <laughs> late. Too late, Florida boy. I didn't know if he was already gone. I, I, now I'm looking back, I realize that he, he was not, but... Um, yeah, too late, Florida boy. Does your phone a friend have any other suggestions for the 2005, 2006 um, Miami? Yes, roster? if I have any other phone uh, for my phone a friend, I'm trying to name uh, that roster. If I named any player who's not on that roster and I was incorrect, I lose all my points. So I was trying to be as delicate as possible to be certain. Walker, the That's yes. the name I was trying. Antoine Walker was there, yes. Antoine Walker. Huh? Was Darrell Wright there? Darrell Wright, I don't know. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Stop playing with Oh man. So yeah, there we go. Combined, um, combined team effort. Some other geezers you got Derek Anderson. Okay, I don't remember. Shandon that. Anderson. Who the fuck is that? Oh nope. Baron. Nope, don't know. Mike, Michael D- Delayak. Oh yeah. I actually do remember the name. I don't remember him really, but I remember the name. Jason Capono. Okay. Didn't know uh, he was there. Wayne Simeon. And that was it. Okay. So I don't feel too but Yeah, that was the couple that I missed. That was the those are the main ones. Any any of those ones that you name any of those ones you named there at the end, I'm not mad at that. I'm not mad no, at that. Yeah. Those ones you named after that were yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's a really good score to be fair. One, two, three, four. Yeah. Six, that's a really good score. Mr. Bennett, thank you very much for your time. Uh got some nice little interesting thank things you, about Miami heading into the playoffs. Um yeah, I'm not too high on them in the playoffs. If they fall to me in the fourth round, I might consider taking them, but I'm not as high on them in the do it. Do it, take it. Great upside. Um, thank you again very much for, for your time, Brandon. Go check out the pod about Absolutely. nothing. Um, some pretty quality content. Like Eddie said, yeah, check us out. Um, it's the pot about nothing underscore or at the pot about nothing underscore. We're on uh Spotify and, and Apple. 
Um, I think we're on Google too. I'm pretty sure. If, I, I believe so. So, um, but yeah, that's our Instagram page. That's where we post a lot of uh, interactive stuff for our uh, listeners and stuff. Do some some brackets, some you know, food based uh, topics and some pick them graphic kind of things too. So we got, we got all sorts of stuff. So I appreciate the, uh, the shout out. If you love humor, if you love food and if you love uh, music, then it's definitely something, it's something worth listening to. If you don't like those things, don't bother. But if you do like those things, definitely Thank you, recommend bro. checking it out. Um, absolutely. If you like, if you like sports and you're looking for a, a good detailed draft breakdown in the, in the weeks following or, or throughout the, the upcoming seasons, that'll be, that'll be us too. I'm sure we'll be talking a lot about this draft, uh, post draft as well. So Last question I'll ask you, who is the okay. second pick in the first run for the – who's Jags, Who's going to be the Jags' second pick after Trevor Lawrence? That I actually really don't know. I've been looking at a bunch of different people. They've thrown out so many different names yeah. for us that I, I honestly couldn't even tell you. That what, that 25, it's too far down to really have an idea What position for me. group would you like? Because I I've still – I'd love like a safety. Oh, I, I, I'd love I, a safety. I, I just think O-line, I don't really like our O-line that much. I, I think it needs bolstering up a little bit. But that's a good point too. If it wasn't uh if it wasn't a, a safety, either a guard or a tackle to me would be would be fine. I think center still is okay. We've moved some yeah, people around, Brandon's but fine. Um, Brandon's fine there. Both both tackles are okay. Uh both guards are okay. Neither none of them are are stand out to me. So I, I wouldn't mind somebody with that with the 25th. Definitely wouldn't be mad at it. Or that early second round pick. Either way. Give me, give me at least one alignment high in the, in the draft. So. Enjoy your recording later on tonight. Peace. Thank you very much. See ya. Um.